Good evening, everyone. Hello, and welcome to the Secret Science Club. I'm Dorian Devins. I am Margaret Middlebach. And now it's our pleasure to introduce you to the president of the Dana Foundation, Caroline Montojo. Thank you, Dorian, for the introduction and to the Secret Science Club audience for joining us tonight for the Dana Foundation Brain Lecture. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Sri Devi Sarma, who will discuss her fascinating work studying brain activity of people when they gamble and what that can tell us about human risk-taking and decision-making. Dr. Sarma is an associate professor in the Department of Bio Biomedical Engineering and vice dean for graduate education at the Whiting School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. There, she develops computational and biological approaches to advance the knowledge and treatment of nervous system diseases, including epilepsy, chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, and insomnia. Dr. Sarma has authored over 150 scientific papers and is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. And on a personal note, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sarma a few years ago and have been very impressed not only by her outstanding research, but also by her commitment to public outreach and mentoring of girls and young women in STEM fields. So Dr. Sarma, I'd like to welcome Welcome you to join us and thank you for speaking today. Hi, Caroline. It's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction and for this invitation. It's actually a really exciting forum. I, I understand there's a very broad audience here. And so I picked a topic that I think everybody can relate to at almost any age. So we're going to talk a little bit about gambling. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen. Okay, and I'm assuming everybody can see this. I'm going to, subtitles are available through Zoom, so you can enable that through your transcription if you'd like subtitles. So um, welcome, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm Sri Sarma, and as uh, Caroline had introduced me, I do work in, I'm in the biomedical engineering department, but we are basically neuroengineers. We build computational models to understand neural patterns in the brain, and how they change when you're affected by specific diseases. But today I'm gonna to talk about pseudo healthy humans and how our brains differ when we gamble. Some people are risk takers, some people are not risk takers. So what's really different about our brains? So hopefully I think all of you will be able to answer that question after today. Okay, so gonna start off here. I'm just gonna minimize this piece here. My titles are just covered, so I'm just moving this over. Okay, so title here is human decisions vary even when options stay the same. So what does that mean? So I'm sure whenever you're faced with a decision, it doesn't have to be a financial decision like gambling, but let's say choosing the ice cream. On one day, you might choose chocolate. On another day, you might choose vanilla, but you always go to the same store, which has the same flavors. So the options are the same. So why are you changing your mind? Well, that might be obvious in terms of food. You might feel like something over another. But when you're actually gambling in a casino, this becomes a little bit more nuanced. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But why is it that when you do gamble, you know, you might be faced, if it's a card game, you might be faced, at it, say you're sitting at a poker table, you may be faced with two cards and you gamble based on those cards. And then 15, 20 minutes later, you get the same cards and you actually gamble a different amount. So why all of a sudden did you change your strategy when supposedly the odds have really haven't changed? Well, one reason, cause you know, as you're gambling, you can be emotional. This is the thing with human beings. Um, you know, we might feel lucky more often than not, or depending on how things are going in the, in the actual game. Um, and that can affect how we make our future decisions, the confidence you have, your motivation. All of these, which we call internal bias, play a role in the decisions we make, okay? These internal bias is dynamic, means it changes with time, right? So as you're sitting at a poker table, you might start feeling really lucky if you have a winning streak, and then you start losing, and then you're not feeling so great. So things are changing internally over time. What's even more complicated is 
What's going on in your brain as you're fluctuating? Where in the brain is this internal bias? How can we study that? Because we're gonna have to image the whole human brain to understand what's going on while you're actually making these decisions. Okay, so we're gonna try to address all of this today. Okay, so how do we have access to human brain? So ideally, for those of you who are not in this field, you know, there's various ways you can image the brain and try to infer activity in various parts of the brain. Most of the time, when we do human subjects or human studies, you can't hurt the, the person. It has to be a non-invasive way of probing your brain or imaging the brain. So typically when people study human decision-making and gambling, they use what's called non-invasive functional MRI. It kind of gives you a snapshot of brain activity every one to two seconds. Every two seconds, say, you get a, a photograph. Well, you all know that sometimes when we make decisions, like when you're driving and all of a sudden you have to slam on your brakes because a car just you know, whizzes by in front of you, that decision is made on the order of hundreds of milliseconds, a flash, okay? And so if I'm trying to snapshot your brain and image your brain, but I can only get a snapshot once every two seconds, that decision is gone. I can't actually understand what actually happened in your brain if it, that temporal scale is so fine. So how do we study human brains in decision-making at a very fine temporal scale? Well, there happens to be a particular clinical setup, a clinical environment where this is actually possible. So what I'm showing you on the screen here is an epilepsy patient who is drug resistant. So about 60 million people in the world have epilepsy. About 30% of them don't actually respond to any drugs. So they're having seizures, these uncontrolled hyperactivity in the brain that could result in convulsions, being knocked down and so forth in terms of your behavior, but there's no drugs to help them. 30% of patients are drug resistant. So what is their option? Well, their option is hopefully if their seizures are starting in some focal area in the brain, what we call the seizure onset zone, if it's contained in a small region, then what you can do for these patients is to surgically go in and remove that seizure onset zone or the seizure focus in hopes of stopping seizures. So the big question in treating these drug resistance patients is where is that seizure onset zone? And often to find it, it's very difficult. And what happens in over 50% of patients that are uh, possible candidates for surgery, they have to actually undergo what's called invasive monitoring. What you're seeing on the screen here are electrodes that are drilled into their brain. Okay, so what you see on the right side here is on this scan, it's kind of a coronal view. You can see each line is a depth electrode and each dot on any of these lines or electrodes will capture Voltage activity, neural activity of a population of neurons is what comes out of each of these dots. And so an example here is on the bottom. So again, these are what are called intracranial EEG recordings. These are in human brains. Why? Because these are patients that are epilepsy, they're drug resistant, and they're in having these implants in because doctors are going to implant these electrodes keep them in the hospital for several weeks because the clinical team is waiting for that patient to have seizures in the hospital. And what they're gonna do is look at these signals right before a seizure event and say, okay, which channel, which area of the brain here looks like it's doing something atypical and therefore starting this seizure. And that's how they find this pathological area of the brain. But most of the time when those patients are in the hospital bed, for two, three weeks, they're not having seizures. In fact, they're normal and they get very bored. But yet here is an opportunity where we are gonna get hundreds of signals from each of these patients' brains at a temporal scale of a millisecond. So I'm gonna capture activity in this brain in all these different areas from deep to peripheral structures in a human being and I can have them play games and gamble against a computer 
while I'm capturing all of this neural activity. So we have here an example patient on the on panel A, you see an implantation. Each of these is a depth electrode going in sort of sideways. And in this study that I'm gonna talk about today, we have 10 subjects that actually played this gambling task. And what we're doing is we're collecting their behavior and their neural activity that was captured simultaneously to study what is the brain doing as they make their decisions. And why is it that some people take risks or do something irrational while others do not? And here is our opportunity to answer those kinds of questions. So across the 10 patients, of course, patients are going to not have their entire brain um, implanted with electrodes. Most of the time, clinicians, based on non-invasive methods, they try to figure out which hemisphere is, is, is the seizure onset zone, and then they just implant half the brain. That's typically what happens. So every patient in this study is going to have electrodes in slightly different locations. So when we combine them as a population, this is what we actually cover. We pretty much cover the entire brain just with our 10 patients. Okay, so this is the task. And I want you to listen carefully because I want you to think about what you actually playing this game. So these are the rules. We tell the patient, the patient's going to be playing against a computer and we tell the patient, okay, you're gonna be playing a game of high card or war. Many of you as children probably play this game, right? You're playing cards against someone, you have a, a pile, they have a pile, you show your card, they show your card and whoever has the higher card wins, right? But in this game, we say, okay, you have an infinite deck of cards and it's not your typical deck of cards. There's no face cards, there are no aces. In fact, there are only five numbers. They're even numbers, two, four, six, eight, and 10. That's the only possible cards in this deck and it's infinite. We also tell the subjects that the cards are equally likely. So each of these cards has one fifth probability of being drawn from the deck, okay? And so with that information, this is what they do on a given gambling or trial is what we call. So they are playing against a computer and what they see is in front of them, a monitor. And when they see, they also have a joystick in their hand. And what they see is a dot at the center. Now, what they're supposed to do is they have a cursor that's not shown on the screen, but it's on their monitor and they have to take their joystick and move that cursor inside the dot. That is a lot that this is what's called fixation by them moving into the dot tells us they are paying attention and they're ready to begin the game. After they get that cursor in the center, the left card, which is their card that's drawn from that infinite deck is shown to them. It flips. So here is an example where they actually get a six card. Remember, the deck only has two, four, six, eight and ten. So this is right in the middle. Now, once they see their card. The right card, which is face down, is the computer's card. But what they have to do is based on their card, they have to make a choice. They have to bet either $5 that their card is larger than the computer card or $20. And they can't pass. They have to make a bet, okay? That's the rules. So in this example, the person actually chose $5. Then the computer card is shown to the, the subject, okay? And in this example, the computer drew had drawn a two card. So since the player's card is larger than the computer's card, they will win the amount of money that they bet. So in this case, they chose to bet $5 and they won $5. If they bet $20 and they, they, were, they won, they would receive $20. Now, if they lose, they lose the amount that they bet, okay? But if they draw, they neither win nor lose any virtual money. So this is an example of a trial of the game. Okay, so this is where you want to kind of get your buttons ready, because I'm going to ask you some questions. So now that you, I believe, understand the rules of this game, and if you were playing and you were drawn on either a two or a fourth, so this is your card, what would you bet? Would you bet, so I want everybody to raise their hands if they would bet $5. Okay, remember, there, you have two choices. You bet $5 or you bet $20 that your card shown here, a two or four, is gonna be greater than the computer card. I'm just gonna get a show of hands. Okay, we're getting some numbers in. Okay. 
It's it's climbing. Okay, remember We're you're giving bet, you're gonna raise your hand if you would bet five dollars, not twenty, if you received a two or four. Okay, it's still they're still climbing the numbers. Mm -hmm. Quite high. We've got two two applauses though. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I think so those I'm are actually, hand raisings too. <laughs> I'm actually able to see the person oh, you can. That are raising okay. hands. So I see that as climbing. And I'm I'm gonna guess that lots of people would probably bet five dollars. Okay, remember you have to make a bet and it's five or twenty. Okay. It looks like about eighty. It's seventy-eight to eighty. Seventy-eight to eighty. Okay. So I'm gonna say, okay, if you chose five dollars, um, that is the correct choice if your goal is to maximize what we call the expected reward, your winnings. If you're there to gamble and you want to maximize your, your reward, meaning how much money you actually get at the end of the day, then if you got a two or a four card, then you should bet low, okay? That's going to make you the most money. All right, so now I'm going to ask you another question. Now let's flip it. Suppose you got an eight or a 10. I want you to raise your hand now if you would bet $5. Remember, your choice is five or 20. You're getting an eight or 10. Would you bet $5? Raise your hand. Now I'm seeing all the numbers go down. <laughs> yep, it's, it's descending. Right, so if you're taking down your hand quickly, you're right. Again, that's the correct answer if your goal is to maximize your expected reward. All right, so now here's my last and final question. What would you do on a six card? I want you to now raise your hand if you would bet $5 on that six card. And I'm gonna hold off. So raise your hand. If you get, remember, you cannot pass. Raise your hand if you're gonna bet $5 on your six card. See the numbers climbing up again. Give you some time to think about it. Okay, so it looks like we're sort of landing on around 70, 73, 72. This is a tough one. So it turns out that if your goal is to what we call maximize the expected reward, it's the same. It's zero whether you choose $5 or, or $20. Why? Because the sixth card is right smack dab in the middle. You're equally likely to win or lose, okay? However, if you tend to be risk averse, if you think about the risk you're taking, risk averse people would say, no, I'll bet $5, okay? Because that's less likely to lose less money if you're wrong, okay? So it's more risk averse. But there might be some of you that are like, huh, it depends, not really sure. Well, yeah, if you were actually in the casino and you were playing this game, okay, maybe you'll bet $20 if you've been winning. If you've had a winning streak, got a pile of money and you get that six card, maybe you think, oh, you've got your lucky night and you might go for it and bet $20 or maybe not, but this is the big question mark. So when we had our subjects play this game, they did, they actually bet a lot like you as a population. So let's look at this top left graph here. So I'm gonna walk you through this. Each color dot is a patient, okay? So I have 10 different color dots. The x-axis here is player card. So we have the two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. And what I'm plotting on the top here is the percentage or the proportion of cards where you actually bet high. A high bet is member $20. And what I'm doing is looking at each person subject separately and saying on average, when they received a two card, what percentage of the time did they bet $20? What percentage of the time on a four card did they bet $20? Six, eight, and 10. And just like you all, when they received eight and 10 cards, most of the people bet high. When these subjects receive two and four cards, most of the time they bet the $5, they bet low. And just like you all, it depended. Some people bet high on six cards, some people bet low. They weren't sure. Now, if you look at the bottom plot, this is the reaction times. How long did it take for them to make a decision? 
And just like you all, they were pretty fast in making their decision on the eight and 10 cards and even on the two and four cards because the reaction time is smaller. But just like you all, they had to think about six cards. It took them longer to make their decision on these ambiguous six cards, okay? But there is something that was alarming to me and alarming to my postdoc who collected this data. If you think about this, the two and the 10 card, is there something that bothers you? Yeah, this is kind of a rhetorical question because it's hard in this forum to actually call on people and so forth. I can't really see everybody. But it should bother you that, for example, why this is the 10 card. You can't lose on a 10 card. The 10 card is the highest in the deck. The worst that can happen is you draw. So shouldn't you bet $20 all the time on a 10 card? Yes, you should bet $20 every time you get a 10 card, which means everybody should be at 100% on 10 cards. Why are they not? What are these guys doing? The green person, the yellow, and they didn't, sometimes on some of their trials, they actually bet $5 when they got a 10 card. Why is that happening? Similarly, this should bother you. When you get a two card, there is no way you can win. That is the lowest card. You should always bet five because you have to. If you didn't have to bet, you wouldn't bet at all on a two card, but you have to bet. So you should bet five all the time because there is no way you can win. Well, guess what? Some of these players actually bet $20 on some of those trials when they got the two card. So why would they do this? Why would, if you take these extremes, why would people do something that totally is irrational? It doesn't make any sense. Well, we're going to address that. Okay, but before I answer that question, I want to tell you about across the 10 subjects, we had basically, we saw three different kinds of gamblers. Okay, so in the bottom here, um, the way we're going to roughly see this, remember there are five different cards and each card is going to be, have a different color in terms of this line. And what we're kind of plotting for each of these are three subject examples, 17, seven, and 16, they correspond to the dots here, okay? Um, we saw three different kinds of behaviors. One type of gambler, which we call static, like 17, essentially did the same, same exact decision on each card, okay? That means they always seem to, this person, person 17, pretty much always bet high on the eight and 10, always bet low, on the two, four, and actually bet low on sixes, okay? So it didn't matter whether they were in the 50th trial or the 100th trial. They were, once they saw the card, they knew what to do. They did not change their strategy. So we call that the static player. Then we had the more typical player, which is like seven, which is always betting $20 when they get eight and 10, always betting $5 when they get a two and four, but flip-flopping on the six. Okay, so the six card, which is the yellow, eh, sometimes they bet high, sometimes they bet low, it depends. What does it depend on? We'll get there. And then you had this an unusual player, 16, that was changing their mind on every single card, sometimes betting 20, sometimes betting five. So we call that a dynamic player, dynamic changing their betting strategies throughout the whole session, okay? But let's go back to this. Why would, and this is 16, the dark green. This is the person that sometimes bet low on the 10 card and sometimes bet high on a two card. Doesn't seem to make sense. Well, maybe they're doing what we think are irrational because of how they feel, right? So this is the problem with gambling and addiction, right? Maybe what's going on is something internal, something we can't measure, right? I can't measure how 16 feels on any given trial. And I, therefore, if I can't tell what they feel, how am I going to predict what they're going to do if they're going to bet based on their feelings? The only explanation I can imagine as to why you would do something irrational is because of how you feel, whether you're feeling lucky, whether you're not feeling lucky, whether you're happy, whether you're sad, maybe they're not even paying attention. That's another issue. Okay, but my hypo our hypothesis was that 
Whatever is causing this variation, this variability in your betting behavior must be because there's an internal bias, okay? So for simplicity, we can think of bias as emotion, but it could mean other things. So we're gonna kind of lump this whole notion as an internal bias, something that's going to make you take more or less risks. And it's not just about the cards that you get. So how can we test whether that's true? How do we test this hypothesis? If it's about how you feel and I'm not measuring and I didn't ask the subjects how they feel, how am I gonna test this hypothesis? Well, this is where computational modeling can play a role. So what we're gonna do is based on their betting behaviors and the cards that they're getting and how they're betting and whether they win and whether they lose, we're gonna take whatever we can measure and estimate this internal bias, right? Estimate how you might feel. So what does that mean? Intuitively, it might mean, well, if we notice that a person is, has a winning streak, we might think, okay, then that must mean that their emotions are getting more positive, right? Again, I can't measure it, but I can try to infer it based on what has happened in the game. And that's what this modeling technique is gonna do. It's gonna use past outcomes and what has been going on to predict whether someone's internal bias is going up or going down, okay? So that's where the map comes in. So just again, from sort of visual, we're going to take the way we're going to build a model and capture this bias. This is the observed behavior. You know, on each card, they're changing their strategies, betting high sometimes, betting low sometimes. And we're going to say that that's a function of two things. One is going to be your internal state, which again, we can't measure, but we're going to estimate this curve from what we can measure. And then there's the card value, a constant value. We probably believe that if you get a 10 card, that's going to bring up the probability that you bet high. This is what's on my left-hand side, the probability that you're gonna bet high would change as a function of card value, right? So it might go up when you have a 10, maybe a little bit lower with an eight. So some constant, but then that will fluctuate based on your internal state or your internal bias. So this is what we're gonna be after is building a model of betting high as a function of these two pieces, internal state and your card that you get. Okay, so now to get there, this is kind of what we call a block diagram or a schematic of the model, okay? So what we're gonna do is the, remember we're after probability of betting high. So on any given trial, we're gonna call index that by trial T, we're going to say that your betting decision is variable Y, and they can only take on two possible values, right? Either you bet high, which we're gonna say Y is one, or you bet low, we say Y is zero. And we're gonna say, let this be a random variable. And we're gonna say it's the outcome of coin flip. If you flip a coin, if it falls on heads, you bet high. If it falls on tails, you bet low. So all I need to do now, if I'm gonna flip a coin, or at least that's my model, is say, okay, What's the bias of the coin, meaning the probability little p that you're going to bet high? And that's the probability that you're going to get a heads. So this p is what I'm after. But we know that the probability of betting high is a function of two things, right? My internal state, how I feel, plus the card that I get. That's going to be this, this term, u, okay? The logical input, which is your card, and how you feel your internal state which we're gonna call X, okay? And what we're gonna say is that these, there's a logical input, what what's, seems rational in terms of what you should be basing your decision on, which is the card, okay? And then, but because we're human beings, we're gonna potentially allow our emotions to get in the way. And both of those will dictate the co coin flip and whether I bet high or not, okay? So we got the player card here, computer card here, and both of them are gonna play a role into the logical piece component versus internal state. But that internal state is going to fluctuate. It's going to change based on past outcomes. That's why I have this feedback loop. So for example, if, I, if my internal state X is how I feel, maybe X will fluctuate based on my winning streak. So based on the history of what has happened in those last several trials. And that's why the feedback loop, this is the history term. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is bring a little bit of math into this and then we're gonna have two or so slides of math and then we're gonna move on. Okay, so remember, 
This is a coin flip. I want to prop, I want to model the probability of betting high, which is the probability of Y being one on trial T. I'm going to say that's a coin flip whose bias P fluctuates with trial T. Okay, so it's a function of trial. And I'm going to do what's called a logistic regression. Don't worry about that. It's basically giving me a formula to say the log of the odds is some cut linear combination of my internal state, okay, which is we're going to call X, my internal bias up here state. It also depends on the card value, which is my logical term, okay, which is in this case, it's for those mathematicians, this is the expected outcome condition on your player card. And then we have kind of a, a constant term D naught, which can fluctuate based on, on average, are you an individual that's more risk averse or more risk seeking? And we're gonna say that the probability of betting high depends on these three factors and are weighted by these constants, okay? But again, I haven't told you much about X. How do I know what X is? It's not something I can measure. I can measure the cards. I can measure your bets. I can measure the outcomes, but I can't measure X. So what we're gonna do is build a model of how, what we believe, how X evolves with time, with trial. So what I wanna do here is let's take an example where X, think of X as how you feel, okay? Happy or sad. Happy means you're positive. Sad means X is negative. All right, so how you feel on trial T plus one, okay, depends on how you felt on just the previous trial, right? It's not, your emotions should not fluctuate and jump based on one trial. So we're going to have some memory of how I felt in the previous trial. How you feel on the future trial must also depend what card did you just get? If you got 10, just a 10, you might start feeling better, right? That makes you feel more lucky. But if you got a two, that maybe that makes you feel less lucky. And then this third term is the risk the, of the previous card value and, and the risk you took on the previous bet. So for example, it's like prediction error. If you were wrong, you're gonna have a positive prediction error and that might make you feel worse. But if you were right, you would have no prediction error. Maybe that one might make you feel better. But the question is how you weigh these three terms can differ from subject to subject. And those parameters are dictated by the coefficients A, B1, B2. But this is an example of a model. It's something we constructed that we believe captures how somebody's internal state will change with trial. So this two terms, this is the first term, we call this whole thing a state space model. For those of you who are engineers, in particular electrical engineers, you might've heard of state space models. This is, is what's called a state X. And this first equation is what's called a state evolution equation. It describes how does X change over time? And the second equation is what we call the output equation. How does the ultimate output that we are interested in predicting, which is your bet, whether you bet high, probability of betting high, how does that depend on the state and your card values? Okay, and so what we're going to do here is what is used uh, techniques and statistics um, to estimate all of these unknowns. So what's unknown here? The A, B, how much you're weighing these factors into your state and how much do these different factors actually weigh into your decision? All of those coefficients are unknown and we're going to estimate them for each subject separately so that I have a predictive model for subject one, two, and so forth for all 10 subjects. Okay, so that's where the math ends. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the models themselves and whether they actually predicted the behavior, especially the odd behavior, right? Where people are doing irrational things. So I'm going to guide you on a particular graph we're gonna take a look at in the next few slides. So this is an example of one of the subjects and I'm going to be giving a graphical representation of the model, okay? So what we're gonna plot here on the x-axis is that state. Remember, this is what I am estimating from the data is this internal bias. When you're negative, you can think of it as you're not feeling so lucky. When it's positive, you're feeling more lucky. And what I'm gonna do is plot this probability, my model that says this is the probability of you betting high as a function of this bias, okay? And I'm going to show a curve for each card. So this is an example of the model that we constructed for one of the subjects, subject seven, okay? And what we're doing is the model is the gray curve, 
Okay. And what's overlaid on there is the actual bet. So if uh, you see a red circle, that's a trial where this subject seven actually got a six card and bet $20. The blue circles are when subject seven received a six card and actually bet $5, low bet. And you can see here, kind of, look at what's going on. When this bias signal is negative and they get a six, they're more likely to bet low. But when they're feeling better, meaning the bias signal is high, they're more likely to bet high. So this bias looks like it might be predicting what this player is going to do on the six card. And in fact, if you actually look at just the bias signal over time, remember this green signal is what we're estimating is their emotional state inside. We are estimating that from the data and using the modeling technique. And we're going to overlay that with their actual six card bets. So the six card bets that where they bet high are the red circles and the six card bets where they bet low are the blue circles. And this is trials. Over, over time. And you can see that when this bias signal is high, positive, and they get a six card, they're more likely to bet high. Okay, so this bias signal looks like it's predicting what goes on in the six card, okay, for this patient. All right. Similarly, the model tells me what the probability of betting high is on a two, four, eight, and 10. And those are these other gray curves. And not surprisingly for subject seven, this is a subject that only changed their strategy on six cards. So static, always betting low pretty much on two and four cards and always betting high for eight and 10 cards, but only flip-flopping on the six. And it looks like our bias signal can catch that. Okay, so we actually have a very good model to predict the behavior of seven, okay? Seven again is a static player except on the six cards. So we build these predictive models patient by patient. And what we found is a spectrum. So just even though our sample is small, 10 subjects, we saw a spectrum of gamblers, okay? If you're in the top left, we call that very logical player. And then as you move your eyes to the right and down to the right, we get the most biased player. So logical means you're not fluctuating, you're not making decisions based on your internal state. You're, you're logical, you get a card and you know what to do based on the card. You're not swayed whether you want, had a winning streak or a losing streak. You're a rational human being, almost like a robot, okay? But then as you move to the right, you can see, oh my gosh, now some of these players are starting to flip on, you know, just change their minds on the six cards because six cards are tricky. And then you've got other players that start betting high and low on the eight and 10, two and four. And then we got our famous, 16. Subject 16, which just flip-flopped on everything. Okay. So very interesting spectrum of players, we thought. All right. So we got all these different gamblers. And remember, how do I get at these models? Remember all those coefficients that were unknowns and I had to estimate to get these curves? Well, what we decided to do is say, okay, do any of these gamblers can, are they similar in, in any way? Could I group them based on some of their model parameters? And without going into too much here, there looked like they were kind of two clusters of, of subjects. Those that actually had this hot-handed fallacy. What does that mean? In psychology, hot-handedness means the following. So when you're gambling and you have a winning streak, okay? There are people that believe, okay, they just have a hot hand that night. They can't win. They can't lose because they keep winning, right? If they keep winning, they must be special that night. And therefore, they're going to take more risk and they're going to start betting high. They think that the odds of the world of the game have changed, but that's a fallacy, right? The odds have not changed. They just happen to have a winning streak, but they're going to bet according to their internal state because they feel great. And then we have the reverse, although less so here, what's called the gambler's fallacy. This also occurs, which is if I just had a winning streak, I won five games in a row, then I might think the chances of winning again have gone down. There's no way I'm going to win six times in a row, right? Wrong. The odds have not changed. The card deck is exactly the same. The odds of winning are exactly the same giving your card. So this is a fallacy. But this is human beings. I don't know. I'm going to pause here. I mean, so I don't know if you watched Seinfeld. There was a um, stand-up 
routine of Jerry Seinfeld. And he asked the audience, he said, what separates humans from the rest of the animal kingdom? Humans and the rest of the animal kingdom. And when I asked this question, especially to neuroscientists, they're like, oh, neocortex, you know, it's all these complicated questions, all complicated answers. But what Jerry Seinfeld said is money, money, because humans do very strange things, irrational things because of the notion of the value of money. And so I thought that was very interesting because it's kind of related to our study because yes, whatever is going on inside makes some people do completely irrational things where they're going to lose a lot of money at the end of the day. And this is exactly what casinos bank on to make money is the fact that we are human beings coming in there and playing their game, not robots. Okay. Robots that have no memory of the past. Okay. All right. So that's kind of finished the, the first part, which is can we characterize the betting behavior of these subjects? How do they gamble differently? Why are some people making bad choices and other people are not? Well, it's because of this bias. Well, if there's this internal bias that predicts their irrational behaviors, then there must be a signal in the brain that is fluctuating with this bias, going up when the bias goes up, going down when the bias goes down, right? Something in the brain must be encoding what we call encoding bias. So that's what we're going to do. Remember, we have all those neural recordings. We understand how every patient's bias, how it fluctuates over time. And now we're going to look inside the brain, okay, to find out where is bias, okay? Of course, it's not going to be in one location, and you're going to see our results, but where is it? Okay, so what we're going to do, do you remember this, the contact? So every patient has hundreds, about 80 to 100 signals that we're capturing over time. So we're capturing it throughout the whole gambling task. And each of these trials, what we call a trial is um, going from fixation. So when they move the cursor, start the trial, they get their card, they make their decision, they see their outcome, they win or they lose, and then they move on to the next trial and they get another card drawn. That's what these trials are. And what we're going to do is we're going to try to understand where, which brain regions are correlated to this bias signal. We're going to take all the trials where we understand that their bias is low so that X of T is more negative and we're gonna group them together. And then we're gonna take all the trials where our X of T was positive, high bias and group them together. And then we're gonna look at what's called the frequency domain. So for those of you who have never heard this, I have a signal that's coming from the brain. This is a voltage activity over time, okay? So it's a, what we call a time series, time signal. And, but what we can do in neuroscience, we often, you know, the brain is often studied and viewed as almost like a radio, that there's signals in the brain that have oscillations at different frequencies. In fact, people believe that communication from one brain area to another is happening through the oscillations at different frequencies. So then remember, which if you turn on your radio station, there's just 99.5, well, what is that? That's the frequency at which your, your uh, car has a filter. It's going to capture any signals that are only uh, communicating at that frequency, okay? So similarly, they believe the brain communicates at different frequencies. Some brain areas are gonna communicate in high frequency, other brain areas are low frequency. So they often do what's called a spectral analysis. They wanna look at the oscillations. So the way you wanna see this, if you're not an engineer, so this is an example of a trial. So this is time. And we're gonna plot underneath is what we call a spectrogram. So this is time again, the same exact time window. And this is gonna be on the y-axis is frequency, low to high frequency. And what a red, it's a heat map, right? So any red means that you have high power, lots of oscillations at that frequency in the signal. So for example, I see very red in a low frequency at this point in time, that tells me that that signal has is low wave, low frequency waves at that moment in time, okay? If it's blue, that means there's no, freq no high frequency uh, uh, portions of that signal in the time domain. 
Okay, so we're going to basically these these plots here tell me something about the power of oscillations when they happen and at what frequencies. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to take all the low bias spectrograms and the high bias and see where do they differ when they are very different. If there's a specific window in time and frequency where they're very different, then that brain region is encoding bias in that time and in that frequency. Okay, so I know that's a little bit technical. Um, this is kind of a sort of a traditional analysis in neuroscience is looking at spectral content, oscillations in the brain. So I'm gonna give you two examples here of two brain regions, okay, um, for a given subject. And what we're gonna see here, this is called the insula, insular cortex, part of what's called the limbic system, part of limbic system tends to encode emotions. Well, not surprisingly, we found that this bias signal, this internal signal is encoded in these emotional regions in the brain, like the insular cortex. And what this shows is which frequency, high frequency, so high rhythms in the brain, and they, we know that the insular cortex, that neural activity is encoding bias because when we look at the power in this region, insular cortex in the high frequency domain, and we compare when the trials are high bias versus low, we see a separation, which means that insular cortex is when you have a high bias, the high frequency activities are dying down. If you have a low bias, you see higher frequency activity. So the idea here is if I just read your brain signal and looked at the high frequency content, I can guess whether you're feeling low or high, okay, in terms of bias. So that's the kind of, so we're looking for all the regions that show difference in neural activity in low bias cases versus high bias trials. Now, what we found, this was one of our main results. Um, so what you're gonna see here, you see time, you see kind of what these MRI looking images, what's color coded are different brain regions and they're colored only if they encode bias, okay? They're colored green if they encode bias in a positive way, meaning the brain activity is positively correlated to bias. So when bias goes high, this brain region's activity goes high. When it goes low, the brain activity. So it's a positive correlation. But if you see red, those regions also encode bias, but in opposite directions, meaning when bias goes high, the activity goes low. When bias goes low, the activity goes high. So it's a negative correlation. And as many of you might be looking at this, these are coronal slices, slices this way. It looks like all the red regions are to the left and all the green regions are to the right. So what our takeaway from this example, or this, this is a population, is that, okay, the left side of the brain, so first of all, many brain regions encode bias, but it looks like the left side of the brain is increasing its activity when bias is going down. But the right side of the brain is increasing activity when the bias goes up. So they kind of have this opposite phenomena, opposite ways of encoding bias. So that was interesting that there's this lateralization effect. Okay, I'm gonna skip this, but essentially what we're doing is we found that this left right brain phenomena is happening in the very high frequencies, which means high gamma, very, very high frequency activity that any brain region who was encoding bias was basically encoding in very high frequency. And in particular, if you had high frequency activity in the right side of the brain, you had high bias, meaning you were feeling good, feeling lucky, more risk-seeking. If you had more high-frequency activity in some of these regions on the left, it was the exact opposite. So this was it. So you've always seen this um, idea of the devil and the angel whispering in each side of your ears. Well, actually, this is not very far from the truth. So what we're finding is if you get that six card and you have higher frequency activity in the right side of the brain over the left side of the brain, you are more likely to bet $20. You're going to take that risk. But if you have more high frequency activity in the left side than the right, when you get that six card, you're not going to take the risk. You're going to be more risk averse. So we call this a right left push pull system, okay, that we found that is in the brain. 
that is the reason why sometimes people actually make poor decisions. And they're making sometimes poor decisions, not why is that high frequency activity on the right? Well, because they are keeping track of all of these outcomes in the past and thinking they're on a lucky streak or not lucky streak. And they're making their decisions that have nothing to do with the cards and the likelihood of getting a card that's higher or lower. So then the last piece of this, I'm done, this is the last slide, is then we're like, okay, so if I know where bias is encoded in the brain, can I just read the brain signal and estimate how you were feeling, right? So this, this process is called decoding. For those of you who've heard of brain machine interfaces, the idea of reading brain signals to try to decode your intent, right? What are you thinking? If I can measure your brain signal and I can tell you what you're thinking, how crazy is that? Well, we're not very far from that, okay? This is an example where we actually, once we found out which regions of the brain are encoding bias, we asked the reverse question. We said, okay, if I read these signals from the brain and I know when they're high or low, can I estimate bias and see how well I do? And so what you can see is the real bias signal is the red and the prediction that's solely based on reading your brain is the blue. So we can actually track this. And this is kind of interesting because if you're interested in say tracking emotion, we, look, we think we have a way to actually track how you're feeling without ever asking you how you feel. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. I'd like to thank a lot of my collaborators. So this work took a big team effort. Um, first of all, these are patients. They're epilepsy patients. They have surgery where the electrodes are implanted in the brain. Um, and so Dr. Jorge Gonzalez Martin Martinez, actually it's Gonzalez Martinez. That's an error there. I apologize, a typo. Um, he used to be the leading neurosurgeon. He used to do about 500 of these a year um, at the Cleveland Clinic, which is the largest epilepsy, epilepsy center in the world. He's now actually at University Med uh, Pittsburgh Medical Center, UPMC. But this was a study that was done over two years ago. So he used to be at Cleveland Clinic and all these patients are from the Cleveland Clinic. Dr. John Gill, neurophysiologist, was um, part of collect, helping us collect the data from the patients and um, an expert in physiology. And Pierre Sacre, he was a postdoc of mine, originally from Belgium. He's now a professor at the University of Liège. He did the, all the analysis, the modeling and the neural correlates. And I'd like to thank some sponsors, um, National Science Foundation, which supported the work of collecting the data and also Kavli, Neuroscience Discovery Institute that Caroline used to be um, a member of. And it was a fellowship based from the Kavli Foundation that supported Pierre and this work. So I just wanted to acknowledge all of them and this hard work. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, such a great talk, uh, Dr. Sarma. And uh, we now will come to the questions part. And Good. you see you have some applause there too. <laughs> now they know how to use that pain down there. Um, we have a few people have sent in and I'll remind people they can send messages directly into me and I can read them to you or they can raise their hand and ask the question. Um, and we do have uh, one hand raised here, so I'm going to give Darby the opportunity. Let me just find Darby here and allow them to unmute and ask. Darby? Hmm. Okay. Well, we'll try the other person then. How about we'll ask Dan, and let me see if I can... Dan, can you unmute? Uh, I'm unmuted. Am I coming across? Yes. So my question is, if I'm winning money, um, but still rational, I might look at the situation as I'm ahead of the game. Um, and at that point, I'm still being rational, but I would be more inclined possibly to bet higher just because I'm ahead of the game and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lose. I'm st even if I lose, I'll still be ahead of the game. So I'm wondering how that plays in because it, you're maintaining the rational posture, but you're flipping just by virtue of you know what's happened before. Right. So 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 the the very fact that you say, well, I might just do even because I'm ahead of the game, so I'm going to just take that risk. That by definition, by my definition, is not rational anymore. Right. So right. the point is, yes, you might be more willing to take the risk because you've got a pile of money, but that's the whole point. Why would you do it 
if you just base it, if you're a perfectly logical person knows that say they get a four card, their chances of winning are much lower. And the rational thing to do is bet low, despite the fact that they have a wad of cash next to them. But just the fact that you said, ah, but I have a wad of cash, what am I gonna lose? Well, that's not rational. If your goal is to maximize your winnings, right? But that's exactly what we do as humans is we do that. We weigh these things, right? Have I been winning a lot? Am I, you know, what's the risk, right? And I bet you, Dan, if you didn't have a lot of cash, but you're running out, you'd probably really stick to the game, right? And make sure that you bring up your winnings again. So just that mere fact to say, ah, you know, maybe it just made you less risk. It made you more risk seeking. And the fact that something makes you more risk seeking that's not about the cards changing, the deck changing, is that internal bias. Because you're deciding to do, so, you're making your decision based on something else, something that is not perfectly a function of the cards. So you can interpret it that way. Does that help? Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to read you one of them now. Okay. Um, okay. This says, um, I have, John says, I have no seizures from t severe TBI and I'm curious about brains from climbing and the gamble there, a route that's different in a manner of speaking to another route. I've been climbing for nearly 30 years. Mm. Okay. Um, can you, can you repeat at the very beginning? And then I think I, I, I think it says, I, it says I have no seizures from severe TBI and I'm curious about brains from climbing and the gamble there. Okay, so a couple of things, which maybe you were getting at, not getting at. So these are not normal, healthy humans, right? Their brains are not healthy. However, every when when a doctor covers these brain regions, not most of them in general are actually healthy. It's a subset of those contacts that are coming from regions of the brain that are starting the seizures. And we we know what those regions are because the clinicians tell us what they determined to be seizure focus after, you know, after they've done their standard of care. So we know when we get the data from these subjects, we actually know which areas are pathological and which are not. And so everything we did in our study is we had a criteria that said, we are only going to say this brain region is encoding bias as long as it doesn't come from a pathological area. And so we, that's how we dealt with, is this a diseased brain? Are these results something we can trust given that these are not normal brains? that was the best we could do, right? Now, in terms of climbing versus not climbing, um, there's definitely uh, you know, areas of the brain that, that sort of encode fear, anxiety. The amygdala is one of these areas of the brain. And you know, these people who do what well, I think free fall climbing, I'm not sure what it, if I'm saying the right name there, but they, they don't have any ropes, right? And they rock climb. Um, I remember watching a documentary, I forgot what it's called, on one of these famous rock climbers that doesn't have any ropes. And they actually did what they call the functional MRI scan. And this person's amygdala was completely had no activity, suggesting that this person doesn't perceive, have the same level of fear and anxiety as a normal person. And that would justify why are they taking all these risks. So you know, your a TBI can absolutely you may not get seizures from a TBI, but there's no question that your brain has changed. It's it's if you're young, it's going to rewire. It's going to decide how to function despite the injury. Um, if not, if if you don't rewire, you might have some uh, deficit, some some capabilities or functions that might have degraded because of the injury. Um, and that if that happens in an area of the brain that's part of this limbic network or the anxiety areas and so forth, absolutely your behavior will reflect that, right? You might be someone who after the injury takes a lot more risk or vice versa, takes a lot less risk. Um, this is you know, definitely the case, um, not just for these uh, epilepsy patients, but patients who have lesions um, in the brain. I don't know if you um, have heard of HM, um, a very famous patient that was studied by a neuroscientist at MIT, Susan Corkin. So this was a patient that in the 1960s, he had terrible epilepsy 
And um, at that time, they took out both temporal, uh, he, the hippocampi, which are the memory areas of the brain, they kind of did a resection on both sides. And so what happened to this patient is he um, lost, um, I think, short, uh, long -term, short term memory, but retained long term memories, his whole behavior changed on after the surgery. Similarly, there is uh, Phineas Gage. Um, this is more related to this work in gambling. Phineas Gage was a famous patient. If you take introduction to neuroscience, it's in the 1800s where workers were blasting rock for, to construct the railroads. And Phineas Gage was one of these construction workers and they used to use dynamite to blast the rocks. And um, he had this like metal kind of sphere, I guess, or I don't know what kind of tool it was. The dynamite exploded and this tool went right through his left eye outside of his brain. It literally shot out through it, went right through it and fell feet, several feet behind him. So he literally had a hole from the left side and he ended up having a hole in the, one of the frontal area, frontal lobe. So he had what's called frontal lobal damage. So what happens to him? He all of a sudden completely changes in personality, socially very different and starts taking more risks um, in life. So the whole risk-seeking behavior had changed. The profile changed because of this frontal lobal damage. So it's complicated. So when you have injury, when you have damage, when you have epilepsy, any diseases, and they start hitting some of these circuits, you're gonna see potentially, whether it's subtle or not, changes in behavior. It sounds very site specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have a question from Fatema. I'm gonna to ask to unmute. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, I did have a question on the ages of the, well, a couple questions related to the gambling pattern. One, I know that you talked about um, how they felt at the moment, but was there any correlation to like their general personality? Like were happy people more risk seeking or more risk averse? And was there any correlation between their gambling habits and age? That's a great question. So our sample size is very small, right? I mean, it's, it's it, you know, people might wonder how did we publish this paper with a sample size of N equals 10, right? Most people do N equals 100, 200, right? To say, be able to say, you know, so with that said, there's a caveat that we only have 10. However, this is precious human data. So of course we're curious, we, we don't wanna ignore it, we have 10. Now, the only thing we were able to do, so all of these are adults over the age of 18, roughly 50% female and male. Um, the only type of test that we did take uh, that was standard of care is neuropsych neuropsych evaluation. So they take kind of these IQ tests. So they test executive function. And um, we have that on seven out of the 10 subjects. And what we saw was a pattern that kind of the lower the IQ, the more likely they were to be biased and be less rational, be more influenced by past outcomes um, than if they had higher executive function. In fact, one of the subjects who did the same thing, the most logical subject who always bet high on eight and 10, always bet low on two, four, six. So it didn't even flip flop on the six. It was almost like when you looked at this person's reaction, I mean, it was like reflex. This person knew exactly what to do in a very large and was not uh, at all persuaded by what is going on in terms of past winning. He won the most money and did the most logical thing and actually has the highest executive function. But interestingly, in this, we're still studying these data, this person also wasn't paying, was paying the least amount of attention. So it's not about attention, actually. This person, it, it just, just know what to do and it becomes a reflex, right? Because they're such high executive function. Whereas other people who are actually spending time and paying attention, and most of those guys were flipping on the six cards. They were like, those are the guys that were paying the most attention. But then we had 16, do you remember 16? That was changing, flip-flopping the mind on any single, on any, all of their cards. That actually, that person wasn't paying attention when we looked at neural correlates of attention. So it's really interesting. The best player and the worst player, when it comes to amount of money they won, both were not paying attention, but they're doing it for different reasons. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, here's a question from Rashita. Uh, could there be an effect of epilepsy on the neural activity measured in these experiments? 
Yes. So, so that's a little bit related to the, the first question and, and how I answered it. So first of all, none of them are having, none of them were having seizures or even close to a seizure event when they did the test. So we only had access to them for about 30 minutes a day. And so we make sure that they're nowhere near a seizure event. Um, if anything goes on um, suggesting that they will have a seizure, we immediately leave the room and we we don't have them do the task, but that wasn't happening in any of these 10 subjects. There are things that happen between seizures in epilepsy patients, which are called interictal discharges, these spikes, spiking activity in some of the channels. So you can see that, you can visually see on this, you know, you kind of saw these waves forms that I was showing examples of what looks like, what a signal looks like coming from one of those contexts. Well, that sometimes you might see what's called uh, this interictal in between seizure discharge, a spike that lasts about a one and a half seconds. We made sure that none of those spikes, because sometimes those spikes are considered, you know, potentially seizure uh, generating, that they could have, you know, caused a seizure, but some other mechanism of the brain stopped it. We make sure we discard any of the data that has any of those spikes. So we try to keep analyzing the cleanest version of the data we have. And then once we do that and we find these different areas of the brain, we want to make sure that they're not regions that were deemed pathological by clinicians after the fact, after they did their diagnosis. Okay, we have a question from hand up with uh, Owen. I'm gonna ask Owen to unmute. Hello? Yes, hi Owen. All right, um, thanks for hearing me out. Um, so I was curious about like the statistical background of the subjects, you know, like, do you think this phenomenon would be observed if the participants had like a probability crash course right before taking the test versus, you know, maybe like a couple of days after, or like maybe if it was done by statisticians that are like really good with probability, do you think, I don't know, I was just curious. Yeah, no, I think things would change if they, as they learn, right? So if at the end of the day, which we didn't do, but we could have shown the total amount of winnings that they, they, they actually accrued in one of the, in a session and then show them. And then if we have them repeat the task a few times and we keep showing them, they might actually start thinking, oh, I did terribly. I only won a hundred bucks. And when I could have won this much money or something like that, and they'll say, okay, what did I do wrong? And then they can learn and then they can learn how to become more logical, right? And because they are getting feedback on the total winnings that they're getting and the more logical they are, there's no question they're gonna win more money the more they play. So yes, I think that ultimately if we taught them sort of some basics on probability or we let them learn on their own by just getting better at the game, then yeah, they probably would be less biased. Um, you know, but, uh, but, you know, it also depends, you know, you have these winning streets and even though they learn, they still might be inclined if they win a lot of money to do the wrong thing. Okay. Um, Eileen has a question kind of related maybe to your last mm -hmm. answer. Um, does boredom enter into decision-making? <laughs> yes. So, it, so this is kind of related to attention, right? Um, you know, we were asked that question by reviewers when we were, uh, you know, submitted our study for publication. One of them said, well, how do you know that they're just doing the wrong thing because they're bored or they're not paying attention, they don't care. And so the way we try to address that is, well, there's well-known literature of how do you measure attention in the brain? So what we call neural correlates of attention. And it turns out that attention is reflected in the brain in what's called an alpha power signal, kind of a low frequency signal in certain structures. And what we had to prove is that when the bias was high, that it's not because they're paying more or less attention, that this is not really about attention, that the bias is not a correlate of attention. Um, but, but with that said, we're now studying attention and it looks to us that that very logical player was bored. They did it, you know, because at the end of the day, we said, we'll give them a portion of their winnings in cash, but it was always like 50 bucks. It didn't matter <laughs> what it was. Um, so they were motivated enough to, to do the task, but that person was like reflex, knew exactly what to do and probably didn't enjoy the game. But then we also had the 16, the other extreme, 
We don't know if their cell phone, I mean, their TVs could be on. I mean, they're in a hospital room. We can't control the environment. So their TVs could be on. I think in one case, there was a cell phone that rang while they were playing the game. All of this will modulate their attention. But 16 could have just been random. They could have been bored and said, I don't care. And I'll just bet high or low, doesn't matter. And indeed, that was the hardest person to predict. Our models didn't do as well on 16. So it could be that they were as good as flipping the coin. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Mish. I'm going to ask to, or Mitch, Mish or Mitch to unmute. Hi, Dr. Sharma. Thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, my question relates to the placement of the electrodes. I'm wondering if the electrodes were placed in the same quadrants or areas within um, all of the brains um that were studied in the n equals 10 and also um my final question is can you just elaborate a little bit on this pull push pull uh dynamic um that's going on in the brain with uh decision making thank sure. you yes so so the 10 subjects had electrodes in different parts of their brain now, what is the most common in epilepsy patients, in, in our, especially in our 10 subjects, are two kinds of epilepsy. One is temporal lobe epilepsy, which means temporal lobe, either in, in one of those hemispheres, the seizures are starting in the temporal lobe. And this is a, a nice example where you see uh, implantation or coverage of electrodes in that temporal area. We also had subjects that were frontal or frontal temporal. So most of our subjects had coverage in majority temporal and frontal areas, okay? But no single individual has the same coverage than any other patient. So we definitely were looking at overlap. And as a result, when we say this region is encoding bias, we needed to make sure at least three subjects had that brain area covered and were showing the phenomena that we thought was happening in the brain. Now, in terms of push-pull, um, the reason we say push-pull is because, you know, the final result was if there's this high frequency activity happening in the right, it's pushing you to take a risk, okay? But, at the, so, but with that said, there's also high frequency activity in the left side of the brain. So they're competing, right? Because when there's high frequency, more high frequency in the right half of the brain than left, then you're more likely to take the risk. But if there's more high frequency on the left side, then you're more likely to take, be conservative and not take the risk. So one is pushing you to take the risk, one is pulling you away from taking the risk. So that's what we mean by push-pull. Um, we tend to have these types of push-pull phenomena in the brain. I didn't really go through that. Um, motor control. So there's this phenomenon when we make movements, there are systems in the brain that tell us go, no, go, go, no, go, right? And whichever one, and, and this information is encoded in rhythms in specific motor areas of the brain. It's about frequency and which areas are, you know, that are, that are more no-go, there's no-go pathways and there's go pathways. And it's a matter of who's going to win it out at, at, in any given moment that tells you to go or no-go. So that's it. Vision in our visual cortex, we have what are called on off fields. So when those neurons, some neurons fire, that is turning things off. When other neurons fire, it's turning things on and making you perceive something. So it looks like this is there. It's, it's not just unique to decisions and not just unique to gambling, but it looks like it's more pervasive as a phenomena in the brain. And I'm not sure this is about evolutionary type of mechanism, what it has to do, but it's really interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, Susan asks, when people get toxoplasmosis from cat parasites, their behavior becomes riskier. Does this fit in with your work? Oh, you know, I don't know about that. Um, if, if, if it's constrained, if it damages a particular region in the brain, I don't know if this person can elaborate, um, if they know if it affects a very specific brain region? I don't know. She just sent me in the question, so perhaps she can raise her hand and elaborate. Uh, yeah, I mean, if, if it's if it's if this particular toxicity is affecting a particular brain area or a network of regions in the brain, um, it very might be tapping into some of the circuits that we found are encoding bias and as a result might make you more or less 
risk seeking. And as you can see, bias was not in one area of the brain. It's not one area of the brain that says, if it fires, you take the risk. If it doesn't fire, you don't take a risk. We'd certainly have brain regions that encode that, but it looks like it's much more distributed across the brain. And so sure, if you have epilepsy or you have a lesion, it can tip the balance, right? Part of this push, pull, no, go, go on, off is about balance in the brain. A healthy brain is going to have what we call inhibition, excitation that's kind of balanced. So this is a problem with epilepsy. There is an imbalance in terms of more excitation in the brain at the end of the day. So yeah, so if this particular disease or um, uh, that you're, you're mentioning, which I haven't heard of, is 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 targeted and and causing lesions in certain areas of the brain. Um, I can very much see how it could possibly alter risk seeking behavior. We'll see if Susan follows up with that. Um, uh, sure. We have uh, Gabriel or Gabrielle with the uh, hand up. I'll ask to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for an awesome talk. Um, I saw in your slide where you calculated the bias for the various individuals, some of them it was hard to calculate a bias for because they were being perfectly rational, all those folks on top. Yeah. Um, what were you seeing in their brains? Did you see the same sort of ge uh, craniospatial signals in their brains that were then just being sort of overruled by what you were thinking was their executive function or rational function? Or were you seeing less signal in those features, meaning there was less bias for them to sort of try to ignore in the first place? Great question. So remember this x-axis is bias. So if somebody has wide range fluctuating bias, then you're going to see, as you see in some of these bottom plots, bias straddle, get closer to minus four and four, okay? Some of these bounds, but look at the most logical player. You know, their bias really doesn't toggle away too far away from zero which means that they don't have bias in their brain the way this person does, for example, or this person does. Look at, you know, I, I know the axes are not all drawn, but this person's bias ranges from here all the way to here, okay? And this is very more, much more constrained. Um, if you look at, you know, if you draw vertical lines to say, where has the data stopped? It stops very close, you know, more tightly around the zero interval. So they actually have less bias encoded um, in their brains, and therefore they're not being swayed. But it's a great question because it's we wouldn't be able to know whether the difference between are they encoding it and it's fluctuating and they're ignoring it somewhere downstream, or is the signal really small? We think it's the latter. Uh, John has a question that it's related. Um, was there data on the reproducibility of these bias measurements in individual patients? In other words, does the bias slash emotion factor hold up as similar in the same person at different times of the day or over time? Or what's the difference in an individual person as a way of saying it? Yeah, that's a great question. In this study, we only had one shot, one half an hour slot with, with these subjects. Now, when we trained our models, we trained the models on about 70% of the data and then tested the, validated the models on the remaining held out set to see, does the model actually predict? And so that's how we valid. I didn't show some of the statistics on the model validation here, um, but we did that for all of the patients. Um, but no, we didn't test over days. I mean, there's certainly evidence that, you know, um, people's emotions, um, like, in, by the way, um, in epilepsy, you know, a third of patients are depressed and they can vary in terms of the depression scale. So we didn't have that information, but some of these very well might be depressed patients or have depression. And that can vary based on time of day. And your brain waves also vary, depend on the time of day. And so all of those would probably play a role. And of course, to the former question about learning, they could also learn. So that once they start learning, this isn't a fairly simple task. Um, they can definitely learn and they can definitely all get better at it pretty quickly, I would think. Okay. Uh, I've, uh, Shana has a question. I'm not sure if it's in your, in your realm exactly, but um, her daughter started having seizures when she was 12 and continued for three to four years and got it controlled with the medicine 
but it started back a year ago during lockdown. She's now 27 years old. She's taking Depakote ER and Zonagran, and they just added Onfi, and she wants to know what kind of treatments or scans can be done to treat or control it. Yeah, so again, I want to caveat, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a clinician. Um, now, it sounds like she did respond to drug therapy, and certainly stressful conditions and age and development can change. And often patients who are controlled very effectively with drugs early on in their childhood, can um, they can become refractory to the medications and seizures can start again. And again, the, the, the idea is to try, usually doctors will try another type of anti-epileptic medication. If the drugs keep returning, um, there is a criteria to deem or diagnose a patient as drug resistant. So if your daughter um, doesn't respond to the new drugs and they try a combination of at least two that are ineffective, she end up might end up being uh, diagnosed as drug resistant. And if that's the case, then there are two real treatment options today. One is the surgical resection as shown here. And then that also has to, has to be determined whether she's a candidate. For example, if seizures start in more than one region of the brain, what we call multifoci epilepsy. So sometimes they start here on one hemisphere and maybe another, some of the seizures start on the other hem. Those are not typically surgical candidates because they just can't take all that brain out. So the other alternative, however, whether they are multifocal or focal epilepsy is neurostimulation. This was FDA approved in 2015. It's a reversible procedure. They're not taking any brain tissue out. They still may actually implant uh, the patient with the electrodes to find out where seizures are starting. But instead of removing the tissue, they implant, they put a chronic implant that monitors the brain activity in that location, tries to predict or detect when a seizure starts, and then applies electrical current into the brain to try to suppress the seizure. That's called neurostimulation therapy. And that is, has been you know, proved and somewhat, almost as, it's as effective as drugs. And that is something that drug resistant patients can, can opt for. Um, the last thing I will say is if you're worried about that, you wanna take your child to a, what's called an, a level four epilepsy center. So epilepsy, epilepsy centers, go from levels one, two, three, and four. An ER neurology clinic will tend to be one and two. Um, they are not specialists in epilepsy. Level three centers, you'll get the specialists, but they don't do this invasive monitoring. They only do non-invasive imaging. And, and some people, sometimes they'll see a lesion on an MRI scan and they can take the patient right to surgery. They don't need to to look further invasively. Those are level three centers. Level four, you'll have the specialists that also do the invasive monitoring. And so if it was my kid, knowing what I know now, and if I think, assume that they're drug, I would take them straight to a level four epilepsy center that's not private, that's an academic research center because they see the volume. They see a lot, a lot of patients. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so good luck with that. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, Bill has a question about him. Do you believe this research can be applied to real life investment decisions? <laughs> so there is an ethics concern here, right? So look, at the end of the day, I mean, we are talking about this bias in the brain that can make you more or less take risks, right? So there is an interest of, can I then just modulate the brain. So there's ways to alter activity in the brain through what we call stimulation. And there's ways to do it non-invasively. Um, you can, so in these patients, actually, you saw those contacts where each contact gives you a signal. Well, the doctors actually have the ability to drop, to drop current in that vicinity of the brain through that same contact. And so they can stimulate different regions of the brain. And they do when they're trying to map out the seizure network, okay? So one of the follow-up studies we're doing here is actually seeing, can we stimulate the certain areas of the brain to change, to alter their risk-seekingness, if you will. So that is the follow-up study to what we're doing. Now, in the real world, um, if you want to do this on healthy humans, the only way you modulate brain activity non-invasively, one of the options is transmagnetic stimulation, TMS. Um, that where you have these coils and you can alter activity in the brain, but there is a big um, neuroethics 
issue here, which is okay, we know we can make people learn faster through TMS. We probably can alter whether they will make a good or bad decision, make a more risk. But the question is, is that ethical, right? Of course, the defense the military would be very interested in being able to make sure that if their soldiers are on the front line, that maybe they should be more risk seeking. I don't know, but that's, that's a big ethical question. Hmm. We're not doing this research for that. We want to understand underlying dysfunction. And we're, yes, we're interested in modulating the brain, but more to restore function as opposed to enhance or not enhance, depending on what you're looking at. Okay. I think you're going to like the next question then. But before I ask that, um, I just want to check how you're doing on time because uh, I, I, I can know. take a few more okay, if, um, if you'd like more. Okay, so Ruth says, this was an amazing experiment. I can imagine there are many brilliant experiments like this one that are charting out isolated behaviors in the brain with respect to isolated situations. My question is around bringing these experiments together. It seems like there must be people working to superimpose these experiments together to form a complex general purpose model of the human brain. Of course, this would be a monumental undertaking. Is this happening and what progress has been made? Well, it would be a huge monumental undertaking. Um, this line of research where you're looking at human brain invasive, intracranial, um, we collected this data over five years ago and it was the first of its kind in terms of having patients do decision-making tasks. Um, about 10 years ago, people were interested in studying memory, speech, and language in these patients. Why? Because as I mentioned, temporal lobe patients is the, the, the most common type of epilepsy and the electrodes are placed in temporal lobe of the brain, which where these language and memory networks reside. So that was like a perfect way to study memory, language, speech, understanding, and frontal areas. And uh, this technique of stereo, e.g. these depth electrodes give us access to limbic, so most emotion and frontal areas, frontal lobe epilepsy is cognition, decision-making, rationality. So now all of a sudden we're tapping into these other networks, which allows us to study cognition. So are we superimposing? I mean, it's really hard. If you go to the annual meeting, Society for Neuroscience, it's about a 30,000 person conference. Um, so it's very difficult to actually coordinate studies and superimpose data um, because it's just really, really complex. With that said, I do think that these recordings are, are, are allow us, give us an opportunity into the human brain that's unprecedented. That meaning you're able to get right at the source, you're inside the structure, and you're gonna measure activity at the millisecond resolution milliseconds. So all kinds of behaviors can be studied. The caveat is access to these human patients, right? It takes a big team of collaboration, volume, actually having enough of these patients to actually study them, right? And in some statistically sound manner. But what the good news is, is the NIH, the National Institute for Health, they actually have special study sections, panels of groups of faculty and researchers that are specialists that are only looking at evaluating proposals that are experimenting on this, this patient population. So they are giving, they're, they're investing, meaning the government is now seeing this as a line of research that can tap into the human brain in, in a manner that's just not matched in any other modality, imaging modality. And so they're throwing dollars at it. And so, so, you know, 10 years ago, they were not doing that. 10 years ago, people would say, what are you talking about, Sri? N equals 10, forget it, reject. I reject this study, right? Because it was also would be new. But now people are understanding more and more people are successfully doing these behavioral tasks and they're finding out new things about the human brain. And those new things are not so far-fetched and outrageous because they look like they're consistent with prior studies. But even though prior studies didn't have access to the same level, right? So the way you convince the, the research community is, I have new data, so I'm gonna find probably things that have never been discovered before. So why would someone believe me? Well, I hope that some of my findings are consistent with things that have been found in the past. So in, with that said, all, all of this is saying that the community is becoming more accepting. They're open to small sample sizes because they know how hard it is 
to get these uh, data from these human patients. Um, and they're, they're, the government is investing and they, and this is the human brain project, right? Um, so, so all of that is basically to say more of these types of research are gonna come aboard. People are gonna start reproducing these studies. They're gonna start studying different functions and they're gonna start piecing the, you know, putting the puzzle pieces together. But I don't think we're that close yet. Okay. Okay. Uh, Daisuke has a question. Do anti-epileptic medications which suppress the activity of the brain cortex change a person's gaming strategy? Mm. So that's a really good question. These patients are off meds. Remember, they're one, they're drug resistant. They still are put on medications just for their well-being. But in this process, when they are being monitored for seizure activity, the doctors purposely take them off all medications, right? Because they're waiting for them to have seizures. They want them to have seizures in the clinic so that they can look at these signals, read the signals and find out what brain areas are starting the seizures. So they take them off all meds. So all of these patients are off medication. So it's very hard to know. One of the things we could do to answer your question though, is just have them do the task without neural recordings, right? So when they come out of the hospital, we can certainly have them come in and run the gambling task. They play the game. All we do is measure behavior. And from that behavior, we can get at least still estimate bias and see whether their bias is changing, whether the behavior is changing, but we will never be able to measure the activity um, again, because because um, that's only coming from the, the, the depth electrodes. Okay. Uh, Adrian asks, um, thank, says, thank you for the talk. Was there any correlation between the flip-flopping decision-making and the location of bias in the cortex with the region in the brain typically associated with creativity? Mm. So um, that's a good question. I don't know if we directly looked at that. So we basically are asking the question for every given region that was covered in, in our population, we asked, is that region encoding bias? And if so, at what frequency, okay? And anything that's shaded here, the answer came up yes, okay? but it was different if it's right brain versus left half of the brain. Um, now, if we take 16, so, so, so the short answer is we didn't actually study that, but we could, that's a really interesting thing. We could go back and look at the coverage of say 16, the one that was super biased and see, you know, where did we cover? What areas of the brain are covered? And is there any particular region that's excessively encoding bias or, or something like that to try to get at that point. Now, creativity, I mean, there is this kind of, the brain is never really so compart compartmentalized. I think that's kind of a myth that we have this brain region does this specific function and this brain. Sure, we have networks that are govern, you know, governing specific behaviors like motor or vision. Of course, we have that level of compartmentalization, but things like creativity, I mean, that's a really difficult thing to measure, right? I mean, who's to say someone is more or less creative? Sure, you could look into some structure tasks that give you an idea of that. But, um, but I don't know of, and I'm not a pure neuroscientist that has been studying neuroscience for 50 years. Maybe others can answer this question. I don't know of specific areas of the brain that are specific to creativity. Now, there's areas of the brain that are strong in terms of visual spatial processing. Um, and depending on whether you have strong visual spatial processing, maybe you're more likely to be creative. I mean, there could have been studies that do that, um, that might then you know, say this region of the brain tends to correlate with creativity. But I'm not aware of that, but it's, a, it's an excellent question. And now I'm gonna go, I'm curious to see if there's any work on that. Okay, this, this other question from Lana is kind of related. It says, does this mean that we might be acting the least logically when we're having the most fun? <laughs> <laughs> I did guess that depends on your definition of fun, right? <laughs> right. So did, did, was the question, do, are we more illogical when we're having fun? Does this mean that we might be acting the least logically when we are having the most fun? <laughs> <laughs> the least <logically>. <laughs> <laughs> um, possibly. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. What's the most fun? If you think, if you equate positive bias to more fun, then they take more risks, 
when they're having fun. The problem is if those risks don't pan out, you start having less fun, <laughs> right? And this bias starts going downward. So, um, so it's hard to say, yeah. I mean, happiness, um, it's a really tough thing to measure. Um, there are uh, targets in the brain for depression patients. So deep brain stimulation is a therapy. So, so we put these, the epilepsy surgeons put these electrodes into the brain to record and stimulate the activity. Now, stimulation is a therapy. Deep brain stimulation is a FDA approved therapy for Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, essential tremor, and now depression. And depression is different. And all of these diseases have different targets and different signals that go into the brain that, that, that are used to stimulate the brain in terms of trying to control behavior. So there are areas of the brain that you can, in fact, I, I, if, I, if I have a chance, I could try to find it. But if you look on YouTube and you look at Helen Mayberg, who I believe is still at Emory Hospital in Atlanta, there is a really interesting video. She was part of a clinical trial for deep brain stimulation for depression. And in the video, she has the electrode. It's in the OR. This is local anesthesia. So the patient is awake. There's an electrode in the brain. And this is a clinically depressed patient. This is a patient that failed electroconvulsive therapy, failed drug therapy, and now is in a clinical trial for deep brain stimulation. And it's in the OR and she puts the electrode in and then she stimulates and the person starts laughing it, like instantaneously, right? And it's kind of, it, it's, 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 it's actually remarkable. Um, it's not easily reproducible from patient to patient. Um, so it's not clear exactly what's the really optimal target, what's the optimal stimulation signal, but it's there. And then people are getting deep brain stimulation therapy for disorders like depression. So yes, there is potentially notions of happy regions, having more fun, and that correlating to activity in specific areas of the brain. Okay, I just I just went online and I found a link to uh, one of uh, Helen Mayberg, so I posted it if people look. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, just BBR check it out. Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Deep brain stimulation and depression, I believe it's about. Mm -hmm. Well, I see we have a hand raiser here, Laura, and I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, sorry, I got a bird in the background. Um, I was wondering how much of this um, is really an adult uh, related. I mean, I know we don't have probably the number of pediatric, fortune, hopefully, uh, children with with these uh, with this procedure where you can measure. But I mean, how much do you think is this uh, risk behavior is uh, developmental, you know, and, and evolutionary for us? Like I'm thinking about how children who are neglected don't engage with adults don't play, you know, they'll sit quietly, whereas uh, children with healthy parents will, you know, experiment more, take risks, because, uh, you know, they're safe to take those risks. So I'm wondering how much of this is actually not so much an adult behavior is, is perhaps uh, uh, something that we're carrying through from childhood. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So first of all, there are plenty of pediatric patients and plenty of these kids get this invasive monitoring. Um, it depends. So there's pediatric hospitals. With that said, the one thing I didn't really mention here is, um, so there clearly we found these circuits in the brain that fire more based on reward, right? That I'm going to feel happier or more you know, lucky if I just made a decision and it panned out for me, right? And that feedback mechanism makes, you know, that it gives me an association between a decision I make and the reward that I feel. And this circuit, um, the re this is whole process is called reinforcement learning, okay? It is necessary for our survival. There is circuitry in the brain that associates decisions and outcomes to a reward or a punishment. So why was it necessary for survival? I'm, you know, thousands of years ago, there's a snake, I get bitten, I get very sick. The next time I see a snake, I'm not gonna go near it, right? And there's an area in the brain, there's areas in the brain that govern all this, keep track of this information. And there's areas in the brain that will fire more actively, be more active when they see a good reward. But basically, this is similar to that Pavlovian response, right? It's like you, if you keep associating a positive reward to say some bell ringing, 
when you just hear the bell ring, you'll feel positive because there was an association built in your brain between a stimulus, which is the bell ringing and feeling good. That is all reinforced. That is the same circuitry, but it's the same circuitry that can also kill us. That's the same circuitry that's hijacked in addiction, right? In gambling, it's like you are doing something and you're experiencing a positive reward. So you want to do it again. You want to do it again. You want to do it again. So, so it's, it's an ancient circuitry and it's often hijacked in situations that where it was function was to keep us alive, but it also can cause a pathology when hijacked in other scenarios. I mean, who would know 2000, 3000 years ago that we'd have this notion of monetary value and we would gamble things away for entertainment and so forth. Nobody predicted that. And yet that's what our brains were evolved to do. And here we go. We do these odd behaviors and we, and there has to be a region in the brain that's going to look at this as a, a stimulus or reward and reinforcement. Come on, give it to me again. Drug addiction, same thing, same thing, a hijacking. So what's interesting is the um, deep brain stimulation has been thought of. I don't think it's FDA approved here, but um, you know, okay, if there's a region of the brain that would fire more when you pop a pill, um, can you just stimulate that area and pop a placebo and get the body to, to withdraw from the addiction? Because there is a brain addiction as well. Right. And so there's all kinds of ideas of how to treat these kinds of disorders, impulsivity and so forth. So also Parkinson's patient who are treated for deep brain stimulation with treat deep brain stimulation, the treatment is motor for their motor symptoms, right? They have this tremor at rest. They have an inability to start movements or they're slow when they do move. If you've seen Parkinson's patients, well, deep brain stimulation applied to the right place can get the alleviate those symptoms. And sometimes it's remarkable when the DBS signals on these people look like they're cured. But also if you put it in slightly the wrong place where you get it the wrong signal, you can tap into impulsivity circuits. So then all of a sudden these Parkinson's patients, that same treatment that is getting rid of their tremor is also making them impulsive. So it's really, really tricky um, how to treat these disorders without the side effects. And, I, and I'm guessing every brain is, is mapped a tiny bit differently. So it'd be impossible almost to really do a global, yeah. Um, this might be related to that. Uh, Guarav has this question. I read about a study which found that a sexually aroused brain was less risk averse. Do the areas you observe correlate with that? Oh, I don't know. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know of any, because sexual arousal probably has also to do with hormones and things like that. And we don't tap into hypothalamus or any brain region that's part of regulation of hormones. Um, so I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap it up with one final question here for you. Um, what, and this is from Kelly and from all of us, what studies are you currently working on? Mm. So I study a lot of epilepsy. So um, not just, so this would be what I call more basic neuroscience. We are leveraging this very unique population to study decision-making. And we've done motor control with these patients as well to study how they make reaching movements and so forth. But ma majority of my research right now is just assisting clinicians in better diagnosing and better treating the epilepsy patients. So for example, some of the tools we built are, you know, they're looking at these signals, right? Every time a patient has seizures and they're looking at this EEG, this intracranial EEG, what do they do? They actually look at the seat, they take the window of the period when the patient had a seizure, and then they see hundreds of signals and they look visually inspect the signals. They look literally with their naked eye and they're like, oh, let's look at, you know, one by one, what is happening? Is this guy, is this signal doing something atypical? Oh no, I think this signal. And it's so ad hoc, so prone to human error, doesn't take into account that the epilepsy might be a network phenomenon, a network disease where many regions are doing something in a coordinated fashion. They're looking at individual channels. How are they going to look at a network? So what we do is we build analytics behind this and say, okay, what do we think is happening in the brain right before a seizure or when you're not having a seizure? And can I construct mathematical models that exhibit those properties of what a region that starts a seizure looks like and how that's different from the rest of the brain? Can I detangle that from using interesting models that can be derived from the patient's intracranial EG? 
And so bring some computational power to the process. So we, we do that kind of work and we, we actually translate. We have an FDA cleared product that was recently cleared to help clinicians find where seizures start by actually producing a really easy to read heat map um, the overlaid on the patient's brain. So instead of having to visually inspect, they can actually look at our heat map on top of everything they else they do. Um, so that's a big area, just helping out with various pain points in the epilepsy diagnostic and treatment process. The other big project we have is chronic pain. So we're very interested in figuring out how to treat chronic pain with peripheral nerve stimulation. So the idea of chronic pain is, you know, it's, it's probably the world's most debilitating disorder in the adult population across the world, something like 40% of adults end up having chronic pain um, in, in their adulthood. And pain can arise from various injuries, various things, it's very complicated. You could cut yourself, the wound will heal, 12 weeks later, everything, the bone is repaired, everything's healed, but yet you get this chronic pain. Why? And it persists. And then we have the whole opioid addiction problem because we're trying to treat, we're trying to suppress the pain. And so what some of my work on right now is, okay, I don't want to suppress all pain. We need pain for survival. I need to know that I just put my hand on a hot stove or on a, on a dangerous uh, you know, terrain or something. So I don't want to block all pain. Don't want to do what a drug does. So can we somehow fix this pain system, the nerves and the signals trends going from spinal cord to the brain? Can I alter the patterns in such a way that I make the pain function look like behave like a healthy person's pain system so that you perceive the noxious stimuli that keep you alive, but you block all the pathological pain that you shouldn't feel. If a feather touches brushes against your finger, you shouldn't feel that as pain, right? So trying to restore more like a healthy pain system. So those are my two big areas right now. Wow, fascinating, amazing. Um, I, mean, I guess you would study those people who don't feel any pain too, that this. Oh, yes. Yes, that's, that's not normal. That's very dangerous, right? Very now. dangerous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. Sri Sarma, a, a fantastic talk and s such great answers to all these questions. Um, I, I sure the audience you. joins us. Yes. And um, from the Secret Science Club, we thank you and the Dana Foundation mm -hmm. for this talk. It's been wonderful. And we hope actually you'll come back and, and talk some more. Let us know what, what's new with you and your research would love um, to love to thank you so much everybody for coming and being attentive and asking great questions it's it's fantastic